Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 106 of Humanity Rising. Every day since the 22nd of May, Ubiquity University and over 300 organizations that have partnered with Ubiquity from all over the world have created on Zoom an open space so that people worldwide can come together to share their experiences of what it's like going through this extraordinary pandemic that's put all of us into some form of lockdown and engaging now in social distancing. We've all become acutely aware of our health and well-being. We're unsure as to how our governments and our economies are going to survive a unprecedented global event. The mission of Humanity Rising is to not only create a sacred space for people, an open space for people, but an opportunity to really look day by day into this extraordinary crisis and try to discern the opportunities that there might be for solutions that we can scale, for new mindsets that could create a whole new narrative for the human race, strategic enhancements so we can ensure that the world beyond the pandemic is more sustainable and healthy and resilient and abundant and in alignment with natural systems. I wanna thank all our live streaming partners, over 40 that we hook up to uh, every day at five o'clock p.m. Central European time, Monday through Friday. We're going out to 15 or 20,000 people. We also have uh, a number that attend our specific Zoom event. So I wanna thank everybody for your ongoing support and the awareness that's being generated um, through these conversations day by day, conversations that matter and conversations that we seek to transform into actions that will really make a difference to secure humanity's future. One of the things that we do uh, each day is a heart coherence meditation. It's crazy out there. It's dysfunctional out there. And the most important thing we can do is build community and build coherence. We've had a number of sessions on the science behind heart coherence. So for the next minute, maybe place your hand on your heart or just your attention, close your eyes and put your attention on your heart. Try to listen to your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude. And connect your heart with the hearts of people all over the world who, like you, are building a better world.
Thank you, everyone. As we try to do with each one of our dialogues, we want to start today with our poet laureate, Kim Rosen, uh, who will grace us with some poems. And then uh, I'll commence, commence the uh, program with Jonathan Porritt. Kim? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm grateful to be speaking to you, wherever you may be, uh, in this incredibly pivotal moment in history. Poetry, in essence, began because a feeling arose from a human or um, prior to human body that couldn't fit into hand signals. And so poetry arose as the first language. And I offer these poems for what can't fit into human language. I'm going to offer two poems this morning, one that I can't stop thinking about since watching the debates here in the United States last night. And that one is by William Stafford called A Ritual to Read to Each Other. And it will be followed by a poem by Anna Akhmatova, who was writing, you must remember as you hear this poem, writing from the harshness of the Russian Revolution in the early 1900s. The music is by Jamie Sieber and followed by a piece by John Kai. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world and following the wrong God home we may miss our star. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade, holding each elephant's tail, and if one wanders, the circus will not find the park. I find it cruel, and perhaps the root of all cruelty, to know what has happened and not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who speak. Though we could fool each other, we should remember, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake. Or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes, no, or maybe should be clear the darkness around us is deep. So I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who speak. The signals we give should be clear. 
the darkness around us is deep. The darkness around us is deep. Everything is plundered, betrayed, sold. Death's great black wing scrapes the air. Misery gnaws to the bone. Why then do we not despair? By day, cherries blow summer into town. At night, the great transparent skies glitter with new galaxies. And the miracles draw so close to the dirty, ruined houses, something not known by anyone at all, yet wild in our breasts for centuries. Everything is plundered, betrayed, sold. Death's great black wing scrapes the air. Misery gnaws to the bone. Why then do we not despair? By day, from the surrounding woods, cherries blow summer into town. At night, the deep, transparent skies glitter with new galaxies. And the miraculous comes so close to the ruined, dirty houses. Something not known by anyone at all, yet wild in our breasts for centuries. By day, from the surrounding woods, cherries blow summer into town. At night, the deep, transparent skies glitter with new galaxies. And the miraculous, the miraculous comes so close to the ruined, dirty houses. Something not known by anyone at all, yet wild in our breasts for centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Your poems are always so relevant. Uh, I watched the uh, presidential debate last night too. I only got halfway through and then I just got almost physically sick at the way Donald Trump was comporting himself and, and um, acting in such flagrant disregard to basic civility, I would say. And um, uh, then I, um, caught the news uh, this morning uh, and um, you know we've been talking about all the vaccines that everybody's expecting well here's a little fact everyone that we should all just take in developing Jonathan you might want to mute till you come on um the vaccine that's being developed is gonna cost over 500,000 sharks. Think about that for a minute, everyone. 
apparently sharks have this chemical uh, in their livers called squalene. And that is what they have determined is necessary for some of the vaccines that they're developing. It's worth noting that each year, 3 million sharks are harvested for body parts, for sale, shark fin soup, if you've been to a Chinese restaurant, uh, various uh, medications, mostly in Asia. And now because of the vaccines, another 500,000 sharks are gonna give their lives for human endeavor. And the combination of watching the President of the United States so publicly and cavalierly demean the office and the sacred integrity that needs to govern democratic discourse and know that already an endangered species is going to be called upon to sacrifice even more to develop vaccines. And the extraordinary thing about it, according to the article, is that the squalene is available through other sources, but these other sources will cost a little bit more money. So as uh, the poem from Akhmatova indicated from Kim today, you know, we're in, we're in a time of sacrilege and uh, the pandemic is simply uh, but a symptom. So we're very honored today to have the opportunity to dialogue with someone, Jonathan Porritt, who's been on the front lines of political activism for as long as I've known him since my Cambridge days back in the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, where I knew about Jonathan. He was the founder of the Green Party. Then he was the director for many years of the Friends of the Earth in the UK. He's a trustee of, of um, uh, the World Wildlife Fund UK. He's the founder of the Center for the Future. Uh, he's written a number of books. Uh, his latest one, Hope in Hell, that we're going to be talking about uh, today. But I think this is a very opportune moment, uh, Jonathan, to have someone like you who, uh, as Akhmatova uh, wrote, you know, where do you go for hope? Where do you go for a hope in hell uh, when <laughs> everything is so um, troubled uh, in the world? So I'd like to just start our conversation today uh, with, you know, your impressions, your analysis of how the pandemic is unfolding there uh, in the UK, uh, how you measure the performance of Boris Johnson, your, your prime minister, uh, and any comments that you want to make on uh, the, uh, the general situation with regards to COVID-19. And then we'll um, we'll go into uh, deeper matters. Well, um, thank you, Jim, and um, I'm really delighted to be sharing this session with you. And thank you, Kim, for providing us with such a powerful context in which to pursue these these uh, this conversation. I, I think our country on the COVID front is marginally less dysfunctional than yours, Jim, but it's touch and go. I mean, we were late to lockdown. We paid a heavy price for that and different epidemiologists have assessed the number of unnecessary deaths that we suffered as a consequence of that. But we're now seeing our second surge and it is pretty, it is quite scary. We Yesterday we had more new cases of coronavirus than at any other point in the pandemic since March. So the highest number of recorded cases. Now, that is partly due to the fact that we are 
uh, doing a lot more testing. So it's true the figures will be skewed by the increased intensity of testing. But we're very worried now that we are moving into a period of time where we will probably now, in fact, inevitably, we will see admissions to hospitals increase and we'll see our fatalities increase again. So we're, we're anticipating the worst. Boris Johnson, our prime minister, who's a sort of mini Trump populist in all sorts of ways, nothing like as bad as your man, but still a shocker when it comes to mishandling a public health emergency of this kind. And he's, he's got things so wrong on so many occasions. And he's giving another of his speeches later tonight, which I can assure you does not have us all on tenterhooks because it'll just be another bit of bombastic sub-Churchillian bluster, which is his favorite um, linguistic device. So it's not a happy place at the moment. People are very confused. They're very nervous. They're very worried about balancing the public health emergency with the economic emergency, I think like we all are, because there has to be a balance, that's for sure. And we we feel that we're led by donkeys at a time when we need the most adept, skillful, sensitive leadership qualities to handle that balancing, the public health and economic balance that we need to achieve. It could, it honestly, it couldn't be a worse time to be led so badly right now. Um, do you really want me to get into Brexit at the same time? Because right now, COVID-19, the pandemic is bad enough, but here in this country, we have the additional astonishing threat of leaving the European Union without a proper trade deal at the end of the year, which now is inducing near panic in business people across the entire country. And more and more citizens, as you may have noticed, are now saying, Whose idea was Brexit? Is this really such a smart thing to be doing? And the, the, the one time majority in favor of Brexit is diminishing by the day as we begin to contemplate the true consequences of separating ourselves off from not just our biggest trading partner, but the nations with whom we most want to work to solve some of these huge issues. So it's a, boy, is it a tricky time over here in the UK. The, uh, let's talk a little bit more um, about Boris Johnson for a moment, because he went through the experience of having the coronavirus, and that did not appear to have any measurable effect on his psyche. There is a temporary humility, I would say, uh, but uh, that's an extraordinary thing that someone can go through the coronavirus end up in the kind of intensive care unit and then come out and mismanage the national policies so um, grossly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how do you understand that? How, how does one do that? I think even a close encounter with death does not necessarily eliminate mediocrity. And Boris Johnson has been revealed in front of our eyes on an almost daily basis as a very mediocre leader, um, a man who actually is, is incapable on drawing on the kind of inner strength we need now to provide people with a sense of purpose and direction at such a difficult time. And, and it's, it's a, I don't mean to sound cruel to say that he learned nothing from mm -hmm. Uh, being in intensive care, I'm sure he did, but it doesn't compensate for some of the basic deficiencies in the way in which he runs this country. I mean, he's deliberately surrounded himself by patently incompetent uh, people who are not able to take up the leadership roles in health, in education. Uh, we've got a good chance of the exchequer now, uh, someone called Rishi Sunak, who is doing quite a good job, so we take comfort from that. But by and large, he's surrounded by a, a, a bunch of very incompetent ministers and, of course, by some special advisors who are seen to be highly problematic in terms of protecting um, the institutions of this country. And again, giving Boris Johnson the kind of advice that would help him to overcome his own limitations and work better, more collectively with his actually really quite good health advisors. So it's, yeah, I know what you mean. 
but I don't think that made the difference, unfortunately, Jim, in terms of what was required. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's such a strange phenomenon um, in history, isn't it, Jonathan? That occasionally a crisis will literally throw up great leadership. You know, one thinks of Abraham Lincoln uh, in the uh, 1860s in the United States during the Civil War. One thinks of Winston Churchill um, uh, in the 1940s uh, in, uh, in Great Britain and Europe. Uh, and then other times a crisis seems to generate pygmies, seems <laughs> to generate mediocrity, um, uh, and an and and almost a willful ignorance um, of of the true nature of reality, mm. um, and that's certainly happening in the United States. I mean, if you uh, really think about the the parallel process between yeah. Brexit and Trump, the similarities between Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, the deep malaise that has gripped the uh, I would say the Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American alliance uh, that has been so crucial over many centuries in providing leadership and, um, and vision, uh, ingenuity, creativity uh, uh, across many areas of human concern. Uh, uh, how do you kind of understand sort of this simultaneous between, I would say, almost a historical social political collapse happening in Great Britain in the United States? I guess it's chance whether or not you end up with, with the leaders you need in a crisis. And that, as you said, sometimes pans out and sometimes doesn't. But for me, when I think about what's been going on in the UK and the US for the last um, 20, 30 years, I think there's a deeper issue. And although maybe your presidents and our prime ministers weren't leading their nations through periods of intense crisis, although we had the financial crash, of course, back in 2008, the truth is they let an awful lot of things disappear. They let them go they ceased to regulate capital markets properly. They decided that the interests of the entire nation would be served best by favoring wealthy elites. They continued to pour trillions of dollars into arms budgets and national defense expenditure rather than thinking about national security from the perspective of what has been going on in our own nations. And in a funny kind of way, I'm almost as cross about people like Bill Clinton, as I am about Donald Trump. Because when you're leading a country at a time when things are relatively sound and relatively stable, that's the time where you have to do what you need to do to keep the roof secure when a crisis hits. And even Barack Obama, and this is maybe uncomfortable to state this because we're all comparing him, of course, with the current incumbent. There were a lot of things that slipped away from him during that time, including climate change, I'm sorry to say. He really did not provide the kind of leadership other than in finding a serious sum of money to invest in innovation and new technology for low carbon economies as a consequence of the financial crash. He did not lead your nation well in that area. And I'm not sure he led your nation as well as he might have done on issues of social justice and racial inequality, which of course is something of a of an irony. But you look at how deep seated these structural equality issues now are climate justice, social justice, racial inequality. These things are so deep in our two nations now that we've almost lost the ability to bring forward alternatives that embrace a much more radical way of addressing those, that systemic injustice. That's the bit that, that really worries me. And sure, I'm seriously hopeful that you will find your way through the the horror of a Trump presidency was something very different from November the 3rd onwards. We've got four more years of Boris Johnson, God help us. And we're gonna to have to find a different way of bringing some of those qualities, some of those values, some of those instincts about basic fairness and justice back into our polity because we're not gonna get it from 
a single person in the Conservative Party. Not a single person speaks with any degree of integrity about fairness, let alone full-on social justice. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a strange thing. I I, I recently read um, uh, Naomi Klein's uh, book "No Is Not Enough." Yeah, and she was making a, a similar point to what you were just making. That really, if you look back historically, that partnership between Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher yeah. was really the beginning of the demise of both countries. Absolutely. Where, um, you know, the traditional values, traditional social structures, traditional, I would say, political understandings were upended um, by the arrogance of neoliberal economics, this notion that government was somehow uh, bad, uh, you know, I remember, you know, it was it was considered funny at the time, but it was devastating in its impact. Reagan's uh, quip, you know, that the, the nine worst words in the English language is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the denigration of the government, the denigration of the public sector. Yeah. Um, and then you're right, following Thatcher, following Reagan, no matter who was prime minister or president, there was just an inexorable unraveling of that great social contract that came out of, you know, uh, England and America in the 1930s in the aftermath of the Great Depression, certainly in the United States with the New Deal of Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, that really created the middle class, that created a robust um, infrastructure of social, social security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, all the, the National Health Service, everything that, that you folks uh, had uh, in your country. And then to just to watch how it was all systematically broken down in our country, whether it was by Democrat um, or Republican. Uh, it, it was, uh, it was, it's been quite shocking. Uh, and then of course her, uh, uh, statement that I think would apply to Boris Johnson, uh, certainly to, to Trump is that if you look at it in the larger scheme of things, uh, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson aren't exceptions to the rule. They are the chief exemplification of a system that has been corrupted uh, by neoliberal economics and the, 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 the uh, uh, erosion of social, political, and economic value now over decades. What, would you agree with this? Would you have a different perspective? How, how would you look at this? No, I think that's absolutely what's been happening. And, and it's, it's daunting to think about the layers of ideological propaganda that are gonna to have to be stripped away to remind people of what a genuine social contract, as you described it, between a government and its citizens might look like, where the reciprocity and the mutual obligations are cast in a very different light to achieve very different outcomes, and where the market is not seen as the principal means by which a nation's destiny is um, either secured or totally subverted. I've got a, a bit of a, a sort of challenge going on for me personally, Jim, and that I like to think to myself that one of the upsides of the pandemic, and occasionally we are driven to, to identify upsides to, to save ourselves from solid 100% downside, one of the upsides, it seems to me, is that the infantility of thinking that the market was really the best means of securing good, good lives for all our citizens. That, I think, has gone forever. I don't believe we'll ever get back to a rhetoric of small state where people continue to disparage the role and the, and the 
uh, and the interventions that government can make. I don't believe we'll ever get back to a situation where people are, are told that the best possible society is one in which government plays the smallest possible role and the market dispenses um, the rest. I don't believe that. And that, for me, is a prize. That is a kind of ideological prize, which we need to nurture now and hang on to and take with us through into this post-pandemic, well, they put, not quite a post-pandemic, but a, a different way of living with the pandemic for however long that takes, and then a different way of rebuilding our economies after that. So if that is seen as one of the great shocks to the consensus, the neoliberal um, marketized, commoditized consensus that has dominated our lives for the last 40 years, then that's a huge plus, which the progressive left and green um, elements in our political system will clearly be able to work with much more effectively than they've been able to do, where all they've really been able to do, and Tony Blair, I'm sorry to say, our most successful Labour Prime Minister for a very long time, Tony Blair, of course, was never prepared to engage in that discussion. He was a full-on neoliberal in many respects, just with a bit of an interest in mitigating the worst externalities that that globalization and neoliberalism caused. And, and he was an effective politician. That's what allowed him to win power in three elections. But he, he further reinforced the dominance of that paradigm, in some ways, even more deeply in our country than was the case elsewhere, because he, all the time it seemed as if he was talking about a much more inclusive, sharing, fairer way of building the future of our country, whereas all he actually did was to lock in really deep systemic injustice and structural inequality. Well, yes, and uh, you know, this uh, uh, is uh, a point Catherine Alexander in the, in the chat is, is uh, wanting to talk about uh, how to deal with propaganda. <laughs> and you know, Tony Blair is a classic case in point, whether yeah. it was the Iraq war or neoliberalism where the rhetoric is so disengaged from the reality, but is so effectively delivered. He was a master of uh, the inclusivity, sort of the democratic socialist uh, <laughs> rhetoric that everybody, I can still remember because I, uh, I was there uh, when he won election and it was like Ob uh, Barack Obama you know, uh, uh, many years later, there was sort of almost a frenzy yeah. um, in the uh, on the streets, you know, in the press, among the people that finally we have a leader that is going to do something transformational. And both Tony Blair and Barack Obama, similarly, it never happened. But the 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 enthusiasm yes. of the rhetoric was sufficient to carry them through. Yeah, ex exactly. And, and now we've got, we've got an additional problem really, Jim, because they, 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 those were both highly skilled, professional politicians, communicators. I mean, I, I was chair of the Sustainable Development Commission here in the UK from uh, 2000 onwards. So I was advising Tony Blair on sustainable development. He set up the commission and, and was very open to the advice that we gave until the onset of the Iraq war. And at that point, he became a very different prime minister, literally. And there's a pre-Iraq phase and a post-Iraq phase. But the difficulty, the additional difficulty we have now is not only do we not have that kind of incredibly skillful oratory working for the good, as it were, but we've got limitless capabilities on the part of mass media interests, all of which, of course, are owned by very powerful um, supporters of precisely that kind of pro-market neoliberal agenda. And a social media world where it's almost impossible to distinguish fake news from what reality looks like. So even if we had a brilliant communicator and, a, and a, a style of leadership that wanted to draw people into different ways of thinking about our challenge and different leadership propositions and different alternatives for this and your nation, I don't know if they'd be 
given the time and the space to do it. Our right-wing media here in the UK, in America, in Australia, uh, in Brazil, in many parts of the world, have ways of crushing that kind of uh, broad approach to um, a more progressive, enlightened way of running countries that, that beggars believe. You know, so we had a very interesting moment here recently, Jim, where XR, Extinction Rebellion, our principal radical uh, direct action campaigning force here in the UK and now elsewhere in the world, one of the actions that they had recently was to blockade the Murdoch press. And they so successfully organized this um, demonstration that they actually prevented Murdoch's newspapers, so newspapers like The Times and so on, from getting into um, into stores. They actually, for, a, for a, a significant period of time, blocked newspapers, getting into news agents and into supermarkets and so on. And of course, instantly, the right-wing press themselves and our right-wing politicians were up in arms saying, well, that just shows you these people are total charlatans. They don't care about democracy because they don't want to allow the free press, quotes the free press, to reach uh, its readers. And they want to deprive you of that wonderful privilege that you have of of, of access to the free press. Well, happily, Extinction Rebellion were prepared for all of that. And they said, well, let's just compare different kinds of freedom, shall we? Because you've got, we have now a set of media interests, self-serving media interests, whose principal task is to curtail freedom and to limit people's right to be effective citizens in their own nations and their own communities. And it was a, it was a, it was a brilliant debate. It's as close as we've got to challenging that uh, media control system that we're all now mm. unfortunately enthralled by. Uh, enthralled too, sorry. We're definitely not enthralled by them, but enthralled too. Um, and which make pretty much everything else we're going to be talking about, about climate change and racial inequality, just makes it so much harder because our uphill struggle is, is the starting point is always going to be media systems that make that very, very hard. Well, yes, and that just made me think of another sort of parallel between uh, our uh, two countries uh, with what happened with Cambridge Analytica uh, <laughs> and the election uh, around Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, yeah. where the right wing um, always sort of defends democracy when uh, Extinction Rebellion does something uh, that <laughs> exposes their corruption, but then what they're actually doing is using the democratic process, using the sacred trust of free speech to disseminate fake news and uh, hateful, divisive um, uh, propaganda effectively that sows discord. And, um, uh, you know, there is a, a, a program, I don't know whether you've seen it, that's just come out on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. No, I haven't seen that, and no. It's well worth uh, seeing, and I'd love your comment, but because this is a documentary that just came out about uh, three weeks ago from uh -huh. a number of people who were founders of Google, you know, executive vice presidents of Facebook, um, you know, senior this, et cetera, on Twitter and, and so forth. And they were making the point that this is the way social media is now designed. Yeah, yeah. To split the polity so that they're tracking Jonathan Port as opposed to Jim Garrison, as opposed to Kim Rosen, and they're channeling information that their analytics are indicating that we wanna hear so that if you, if you uh, type in uh, climate change, one person will get that it's a crisis, another person will get it's fake news, <laughs> another person will get uh, uh, you know, another uh, piece of information. So in effect, what the Russians did and what Cambridge Analytica did wasn't illegal. It was just using the system as it was designed initially by the corporate interests 
to maximize their revenue from advertising. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we're in a system that, as you say, you know, we've come a long way since Reagan and Thatcher. And, um, you know, how do you view this, uh, Jonathan, the, the, the impact of social media, kind of the fake news, the alt-right um, uh, uh, through the Murdoch empire, et cetera, uh, and its impact on democracy? Yeah. Well, I will, I will get hold of the, the social dilemma because these are also, of course, the, the founders of the, of the IT companies. And these are the people who are now saying that they don't let their kids spend yeah. more than an hour a day on any exactly. of their devices for fear of their brains being completely adulterated. And you do have to look at that stuff and say, OK, so you've made your billions. What exactly are you going to do with those billions now? ill-gotten or not, to help defend democracy against this systemic assault, which is what it is. Literally, that's what it is. And I suppose I would measure the value of those contributions based on the investment they make in pro-democracy uh, organizations and media organizations, because there are a lot of people who are helping to protect us in terms of the work they do, monitoring the media, sorting out fake news from real news, doing a ton of stuff to defend um, impartial journalism, that all of those counter movements are going to need massive support to offset the power of these, of these inbuilt algorithms that drive polarization. It's going to need huge support. So I guess my starting position on that is that we, not enough people currently understand the nature of that challenge. But when people do get their heads around some of these issues. The readiness to find a better way is growing. And I don't know, Jim, I don't know where you are in terms of your hope quota at the moment, but I do take some comfort from the fact that an increasing number of young people are pretty savvy about the way in which social media works and pretty savvy about how their data can be used and manipulated against them. And I'm struck by the fact that because this is the world in which they've grown up, that they're likely to be infinitely more adept at managing those manip manipulative forces than we were, because to a certain extent, it happened under our noses, but we weren't very skillful in terms of understanding the nature of those, those forces. I don't get that feeling with young people, although I'm slightly, my hopefulness is slightly undone, of course, by the the degree to which young people don't really seem to care how their data is being used um, sometimes and don't use even basic privacy settings and don't kind of do the obvious things because they don't think it's important enough. Well, mm, I wonder at what point they'll begin to think maybe that is, that is something we have to address. But I'm sorry to hear, Jim, that you still think that your media are totally um, uh, working in the wrong direction on things like climate change. My heart lifted when I heard the other day that Fox News has appointed its own climate change correspondent. I thought to myself, this is a moment, this is a significant breakthrough in the world of Western enlightenment that Fox News actually now has a designated go-to climate change correspondent. I mean, bloody hell, stop moaning about it. This is, just shows what happens when good science gets taken up by responsible media. I'm being a touch ironic, obviously, but you know. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the collusion, I would say, Jonathan, around climate change is, is one of the most puzzling um, tragedies, I think, of our time. You know, one thinks back, for example, uh, around the issue of ozone. Mm. And you'll remember that you were probably involved in that struggle. And that was during the Reagan administration. But once the scientists pointed out to the governmental leaders, hey, guys, we're, we're punching holes in the ozone. And if we punch holes in the ozone, uh, all kinds of bad things are going to happen to planet Earth. The governments took that in and we had a treaty that uh, didn't, you know, solve the problem completely. But indicated international capacity to deal with a problem that was transnational. 
that had been revealed by science as critical. And as a result of the, the hole in the ozone, as far as I understand it, you may have other information, has been essentially uh, ameliorated. And then you come to climate change. Just before you go to climate change, Jim, yeah. can I interrupt with one tiny addition to the Please. ozone story, which is really important and often does get left out when people are comparing, why could we do it with those, the ozone layer and we can't do it with climate change? The one extra dimension was when the big multinational companies, in your case, DuPont primarily, in our case here in the UK, a company called ICI in those days, reassured their governments that they could bring forward drop-in substitutes for the chemicals that were causing the damage to the ozone layer, the chlorofluorocarbons. And they would be able to do this at speed without a huge amount of additional cost, and they'd be able to make more money out of them. And behind the scenes, those companies were saying to the politicians, yeah, relax, it's okay. It sounds pretty dramatic phasing out chlorofluorocarbons in an eight, eight year period of time. It's okay. We've got tons of good chemicals to stick in there to do the job just as well. And we're happy as Larry because our profits are gonna be reinforced. Now we don't have that. I know you're going to get on to the climate story. We don't have that. Uh, we haven't had that up until now on climate because there was no drop-in substitute for fossil fuels. The really exciting analogy for me now is we're pretty close to a drop-in substitute with renewable energy. And the amazing thing is it's coming in cheaper now than renewable than fossil fuel, hydrocarbon based energy sources. And the only thing that makes this analogy almost stand up is there are a lot of people out there now looking forward to making trillions of dollars out of the new 100% renewable electricity economy. A lot of people who may not care very much about climate change, but they sure as hell care about having a different way of deriving their profits and their dividends um, once they can no longer squeeze, extract that value out of hydrocarbons. So we're, we're quite close to the point where we've got where the analogy comes good. Up until now, unfortunately, it hasn't really worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And there's a, something in the chat from Paul Coleman, who's in Patagonia, saying that he wasn't so sure about the success of our uh, amelioration of ozone because <laughs> in Patagonia, the tips of the native fu fuchsia uh, plants literally burnt off a few years ago. So uh, I think we yeah. should take Paul's point that the problem hasn't been totally solved, but, but no, yeah, the it's an example solved. of where the international community came together, informed by science, the corporate yeah. sector for all kinds of complicated reasons supported the um, yeah. the ban on um, CFCs and we we kind of saved ourselves a massive problem. Just think if we'd have done nothing on the ozone back in the 1980s, where we would be yeah. today. Not a happy thought, made, I can tell you. Yeah. Not a happy so, thought. Yeah, it is it is not yeah. a happy thought. Now in your in your view because you you've been the green party friends of the earth wwf uh the center for the future i mean you've been in the environmental movement forever jonathan that's essentially your life and yep. <laughs> uh, what how where do you think we are in terms of climate change are, are have we passed the point of no return are we at a tipping point I mean, where do you, uh, Jonathan Porritt, given everything you know, um, where do you think we, we are, uh, first of all? And then out of everything that you know, um, what is your sense of what we, if you had to order the priorities for the world community on how to stop this thing, which is clearly spinning out of control, what what would those be? Yeah. <laughs> well, on the story of 
of whether we've got any justification for what I call authentic hopefulness, um, as in it's not too late to do what we need to do to prevent uh, runaway climate change. And there's a big distinction between climate change that is continuing to get worse day by day and runaway or irreversible climate change. It's a huge, these are two different scopes for us to deal with, but obviously accelerating runaway, irreversible. That's the kind of sequence that we're looking at. In my opinion, I'm not a scientist, Jim, as you know, so I can only go on the science that I read and I am a, 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 a real SWAT when it comes to keeping track of the science because I'm much more exposed by not being a scientist and therefore I, I really do feel I need to get my head around that. My sense of it is that when it's not too late to do what needs to be done to um, in, in the first instance, restrict the emissions of these greenhouse gases. And then in the second instance, to get onto a pretty dramatic downward trajectory so that we actually see those concentrations in the atmosphere come down and down and down again, back to something. We'll never get back to pre-industrial levels, but we can get it back to something that would still give us a reasonable chance. No guarantees here at all with any climate scenario that you can think of, but I call, it, I call it a reasonable chance of a stable climate for the future of humankind. We can still do that, but the change process is, is dramatic. It's, it's, it's extraordinary to think of what we have to do. So the technology story I just mentioned um, before is a critical ingredient in that. So one tiny thing to add to the mix here on the business front, the, the, the ex it is actually remarkable that business leaders are now many years ahead of politicians when it comes to understanding the nature of this existential threat and opportunities to maintain what they would still see as market-led prosperity, even in a time of dramatic decarbonization. A lot of business leaders have looked into that place and they've said, whoa, okay, that's, that is going to be tricky. But yeah, we can do that. Most decarbonization means increased efficiency, which means reduced costs. It means new market opportunities. It means all sorts of ways of keeping a business model still more or less intact. And the politicians are nowhere near that place yet. They just don't get it. So for instance, even your very, the worst possible epitome of self-serving kleptocratic, greedy business people in the USA represented by the US Business Round Table, which is a bunch of egregious criminals in, in many respects, they've started to talk the language of inclusive capitalism, stakeholder capitalism. I don't believe a word of it, by the way, but at least the words are now forming in their mouths. And you know what it's like? It's with some people, you need to hear the words before the brain starts working on the words. It's a funny kind of process. And not only that, they're now out there advocating for a carbon tax and quite a stiff carbon tax as well. Now, please note, Jim, none of this actually entails a threat to the supremacy of the market because the carbon tax still allows for a market based set of solutions to be brought right. forward. And they're still as resolutely hostile about regulatory interventions rather than market mechanisms to bring about the changes that are necessary. But if if the business round table in the US can begin to shift its views. And I don't really mean they're personally criminals, you understand, but the, the kleptocracy that they represent has succeeded in extracting value out of the American economy to a degree that is the best possible proxy for criminality that you can imagine. If even the business round table is beginning to see which side of the line they now need to stake their own future self-interest, oh, well, there are sort of reasons to be hopeful in that regard. <laughs> well, as someone uh, said on one of the sessions uh, here on Humanity Rising uh, last week, hypocrisy is the first step to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if they can't even marshal the energy to be hypocrites then we know that we've lost <laughs> it <laughs> it's true <laughs> so this brings us jonathan to your new book uh hope and hell we've described some of the hellish aspects of our reality which are clear and dire and immediate uh 
to uh, people worldwide. Uh, and um, your new book is about a hope in hell. So talk to us about your book and, and where you're drawing hope um, yeah. uh, for the future. Because it's important that we, we keep our vectors tracking on hope. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I want to come back to this notion of authentic hope rather than what I call shiny optimism. And shiny optimism is when people just think technology will get it all sorted for us. And don't ask me to do anything about racial inequality, systemic injustices, and threats to the democracy, because I just want to marshal this technology power to sort out climate change and all will be well. We know we're dealing with a very brittle sense of hope in that regard. I don't really call that hope. I call that shiny, untutored, ungrounded, and actually phony optimism. So if I think about authentic reasons to be hopeful, I am unapologetic about talking up technology potential because Honestly, without this revolution in energy systems, you couldn't talk about a sustainable world for 9 billion people. It doesn't make any sense. Energy underpins everything we need to do. And if we can provide the energy services that people need without causing this massive life-threatening externality, then we've got a chance of doing the rest. If you can't do that, then there is no rest. There's nothing left. So I'm, unlike a lot of greenies who've always been as, as nervous as I am about techno-fixing, I still want to talk up technology done in the right way and in a socially just way. So the just technology transition is critical. Secondly, although I've been very rude about this, business, business leadership can't be dismissed. It matters. We've given such weight and authority to business leaders in society now for so many, so many years that we need those business leaders on board working for this similar agenda. We, it can't be done without if we get into a total standoff where the majority of business leaders are intransigently dying in the same ditch as some of the fossil fuel companies, then it's very hard to do that. So that's my second source. My third source is I have a abiding interest in what is going to change in the, in the minds and the leadership of the world's religions and faith groups and the spiritual movement more broadly, because I wouldn't call it a sleeping giant. But boy, is it an influence in the lives of countless billions of people. And I don't think we've yet seen the full extent of what real leadership for fair, low carbon prosperity justice would look like. And then lastly, I'm big on young people because 2019 for me was a revelatory year when we saw this explosion of, of um, passion and anger and concern from young people all around the world, 7 million young people involved in protests around the world by the end of 2019. And I, I celebrated that. I, it, for me, it was like a transfusion of um, campaigning energy into my, into my weary veins because you suddenly thought, okay, every single time, the wonderful organizations in the US, for instance, Sunrise Movement and all the rest of it that you've got. Every single time they succeed in getting large numbers of school kids to leave their place of learning and make their views known to the politicians. You have succeeded in getting them onto a path of civil disobedience. I don't know exactly what the state of the law is in the US, but in the UK, if you bunk off school with or without permission from your parents, you are breaking the law. Mm. And, and for me, there's something powerful going on here. So at the end of 2019, I see these as 7 million new recruits into the benefits of civil disobedience. And why will they not take those attitudes and behaviors with them now into what happens next in their lives, in their education, in their jobs, in whatever walk of life they choose to end up in? Once you've been involved in civil disobedience, you can deepen it, you can take it further in your life. And I am now passionate that part of my role, and I think a lot of us oldies, is to work in service 
to the passion and energy of young people because that's where the changes will come, I think. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's very uh, heartening. And uh, I, I, you know, I in my youthful days, I was at the forefront <laughs> of, of yeah. civil disobedience at nuclear power plants. It's what they call the, the clamshell alliance there in exactly. New Hampshire trying to stop the Seabrook uh, power plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma, shutting down the Black Fox nuclear reactor at the Pentagon. Um, you know, I, I was I think I've been arrested a half a dozen times for some form of civil disobedience. So I'm delighted, Jonathan, uh, to have you talk about uh, the young and civil disobedience, because uh, I think in my view, we're coming down to, are we willing to put our bodies down? Yeah. Are we willing to take a stand independent of consequences and independent of the law, bearing in mind that back in the day when you and I were running around, you know, like with, with knife, knives between our teeth, as it were, in, in revolutionary fervor, the laws favored free expression. Yeah. Now in the United States, it's become a felony, a big time criminal offense with prison time um, for doing acts of civil disobedience that, you know, even in the 1950s, 1960s with the, the civil rights, Martin Luther King, it'd be very interesting to see how a Martin Luther King would fare uh, with the draconian laws that are being in place now. Um, by the Trump administration uh, and uh, national governments in light of the Patriot Act and national security uh, concerns, yep. uh, et cetera. So speak to us about civil disobedience under current circumstances. Why is it important? Um, why do you support it? Um, uh, how is that a pathway forward? <laughs> yeah, well, Jim, as you say, we, we both draw on the same heritage there. But that's why writing Hope in Hell actually for me was quite a, genuinely quite a painful experience because I had to revisit lots of assumptions. I had to, I had to rework my n knowledge of the current state of play on climate science. I had to look at that gap between what the science tells us and what politicians are doing. Yeah. And once you look at that gap and you impartially ask yourself, can you see any way in which the politicians through conventional political norms, practices and processes are going to do what's required to get rid of the gap? And if, you're, if your answer, my answer in this case to that question was no, they are not going to do it without some very profound changes in the way our more or less functional democracies operate then you have to say, okay, well, what will narrow the gap? And the only answer I could come up with to that question was additional political pressure being brought to bear on those political systems by people prepared to commit to civil disobedience, including nonviolent direct action. There are many other kinds of civil disobedience, as you know very well, but to be prepared to commit to that. And for me, one interesting and and profound consequence for me is that I can't see how I can support young people in their campaigns to help narrow that gap through including civil disobedience. I can't see any way of doing that with integrity if I'm not prepared to do that myself. Mm. And that there is therefore a kind of <laughs> coming home almost to the radical origins of my involvement in green politics. Um, and that's after spending, as you know, a, a long time working with government and businesses and NGOs and all the rest of it. And I'm not in any way disparaging the value of doing that. I'm not saying everybody has to stop doing that. You don't ever think that's still really important. But for I can't now, for me, contemplate anything other than being prepared to stand alongside those young people who are prepared to do that for their future and for, for the future of the planet. It would, it would be unspeakably 
hypocritical to to be cheering them on from the sidelines. Yeah, go for it. Fantastic. That's really good. Only 70 of you arrested today. We need more. It's not, that doesn't, you know, you can't do that. You can't do that. So I don't know. I'm having difficulty interpreting that in the year of the pandemic because I'm a bit reluctant. I'm sort of slightly easier about the notion of being arrested than I am about contracting COVID-19. So I'm sort of juggling a bit with what I can and can't do in this interim phase. But in the longer term, I know what it means for me personally. Yeah, you know, Amy Blumenshine is just making, I think, a very important point in the chat, uh, Jonathan, to say that our governments are no longer petitionable. Yeah. Since the wealth Absolutely. distribution is so skewed into the hands of a few, the governments can't afford to challenge wealth or wealth will unseat them. That's a brilliant point that our governments are no longer petitionable. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, a scary, that's a really that's a really scary insight, and it and it's true. They are beyond the reach of some of those democratic processes, which did once make a difference, maybe less of a difference than we thought, but they did make a difference. And actually, to bear that out, the interesting thing when the when the UK government was the first OECD country to declare a, a climate emergency and then to commit in law to being a net zero economy by 2050 that is now enshrined in uk law it's almost unbelievable to think about this but it is that was a direct consequence of all the campaigning in 2019 through extinction rebellion and young people that was wow. the consequence of those actions on the ground <laughs> So they weren't conventionally petitionable by the likes of good old NGO tactics, walking the yeah. corridors of power and saying, no, you really should be doing this. And you must read this weighty article about the science of the Antarctic or whatever it might be. They were no longer open to that. But suddenly this explosion of, of concern and, and indignation about the dereliction of duty on their part did lead to some, some actually quite profound changes. I know net zero by 2050 is hopelessly inadequate. You don't need to put that in the chat box. I know that. But even so, to get yeah, our yeah. government to commit to that idea of a net zero form of prosperity was, was pretty startling. I think mm. Theresa May, who was the one, she was still our prime minister when that was agreed. She looked pretty startled at the time as well, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Marilyn Hamilton, who you know, uh, just wrote no. something that uh, would be worth your comment. She said, Jonathan, when you were here at Fintorn Climate Consciousness Conference last year, the young people asked us elders if we would stand in the gap for them as they were too young to sit in jail. It was the hardest question I have ever been asked. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and uh, I, for me, this this kind of intergenerational sharing the justice side of generations working together now is i think going to be the most powerful part mm. of a reinvigorated climate movement in 2021 i really do and i think more and more oddly enough it may have skipped a generation i think it's likely to be grandparents or people of grandparental age even if they don't have children themselves and young people that that combination is almost more powerful than kids and their parents, where relationships are always slightly harder and you can't quite see that working so powerfully. But pe people who are a bit older looking back now on the degree to which they have not been as actively committed to making a good world for their grandchildren, that is a, that's a fearsome power as we know. If you can unroll the power of our old age pensioners and our young thrusters, our young, <laughs> young campaigning activists and get them working in harness together, you have to be a pretty powerful political force to deal with that. Well, yes, and you know, you, you, you think of uh, what's going on in uh, uh, Belorussia or the Ukraine a few years before that, you will remember solidarity in Poland uh, yeah, uh, when we were in our heyday in Czechoslovakia with Václav Havel, you know, when the people of the of a culture 
rise up en masse, yeah. it becomes the strongest force in the world. Yeah. The question is, what will cause them to do that? <laughs> and um, so uh, that that would be, I think, a, a, a final question to you, you know, because I could agree with you 100 percent that, you know, as a father of two young men now close to 30, um, you know, I you and I came out of the uh, the baby baby boomer 1960s. Uh, generation. And now we've got millennials and Gen Zs. In our day, we talked about the generation gap. And now there's no gap. The, the, the moral <laughs> value proposition between the grandparents and the grandchildren, the value proposition is basically the same. Mm-hmm. You know, those 7 million young people that, that rose up, as you indicate, were doing it the same value s- system that we did uh, back when we were young. Mm-hmm. And um, so in closing, uh, Jonathan, um, humanity rising, right? What do we, what's, that's our greatest hope. What in your view is necessary to catalyze millions of people to stand as one to demand change? This is a slightly predictable answer to your question, Jim, but you can't you can't do away with the awareness factor which we need. And the 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 power about young people is they're looking at this stuff. They're looking at the science of climate change, they're looking at the data, they're looking at the implications of a one meter sea level rise by 2100. And they're thinking to themselves, I'm, I'm still going to be alive in 2100. It could be two meters of sea level rise. They're, they're sharing this stuff regularly all the time. Added to which we've got this wonderful thing called the proximity principle, which I put quite a bit of faith in. It does actually work even in the USA, that the closer you or your loved ones are to a climate-induced disaster, the greater your readiness to see and ask for change on climate policy. So it's a sad truth but the greater the number of people impacted by worsening Mm -hmm. climate disasters the greater their readiness to insist on their politicians making the necessary changes and yours is a nation that is just as much on the receiving end of climate induced disasters as any other nation in the world today that is people have always said a lot of this climate stuff is going to impact on the poorest people in the world well actually it's going to impact a lot on the poorest people in the rich world as well as the poorest people in the poor world. And we're seeing that play out now. So I don't want it to be this way. I'd like people to be able to come to a growing awareness about the threats of climate change and the opportunities to do what we need to do about that threat without inflicting massive amounts of pain on society and on people. But I'm not sure we're that smart. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, uh, thank you so much for who you are and what you've represented for many, many decades. And I think the title of your book, Hope and Hell, both describes our current reality and predicament. And I think over the last uh, hour or so, you've given us a measure of the hellishness and the grounds for hope. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today. And maybe a couple months down the road, uh, we'll circle back and, and deepen the dialogue. Uh, but you're doing great work, brother. It's been an honor to know you over these years. And, and I salute everything that you're doing uh, on behalf of us all. Thank you, Jim. Likewise. And humanity is rising. That's for sure. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Stick with it. That's the deal. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. And as a play on Reagan, you know, it's, it's not any longer we're we're from the government. We're here to help. We're from <laughs> humanity. Yeah. <laughs> and we're here to rise with you. That's Absolutely. that's where the world has come to. And that's the grounds yeah. for hope. So thank you, brother. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn it over to Kim. Kim, give us some poetry as we as we close out today. I am so inspired by this conversation and I'm especially picking up 
on the last bit about the next generation coming to the fore. And I'm going to do something I don't usually do. I'm going to read a poem by a dear friend, an amazing poet, friend of mine named Alison Luderman, called The New Breed, which she wrote for Emma Gonzalez and the student activists. Do you remember who Emma Gonzalez is? We must never forget. The music is again by Kai Engel. I see her on TV, shaven-headed, shouting and crying into a microphone, bright as a panther, cheeks glittering with rage. Her high school was just shot up. She's had to walk by friends lying in their own blood. She's my daughter, and your daughter, and everyone's daughter, unleashed, unashamed in the fullness of her young fire. And she's a woman calling bullshit on politicians who take money from the NRA. Tears rain down her face, but she doesn't stop. She doesn't apologize. She keeps calling them out, all of them, all of us, who didn't do enough to stop this thing. And thoughts and prayers don't work anymore. And you can see the faces of the old dinosaurs in charge contort, utterly baffled to face this new breed of young woman, not silky, not compliant, not afraid of what they think. Whatever they say about her, she won't shut up. She will not stop yelling her facts and figures into the mic. And it's not like any of us road weary older ones have been given the all clear exactly but our shoulders do let down a little our feet pick up we breathe from a deeper place as we say to each other well it looks like the baton may be passing to these next runners and they are faster than thought, fiery as stars, and we take another breath and say to each other, the baton has really been passed, and we set off running hard after them. Whatever they say about her, she won't shut up. She will not stop yelling her facts and figures into the mic. And it's not like all of us road-weary older ones have been given the all clear exactly. But we say to each other, well, it looks like the baton may be passing to these next runners, and they are faster than thought, fiery as stars. And we take another breath and say to each other, the baton has really been passed, and we set off running hard behind them. It's a poem by Alison Luderman with music by Kai Engel. The poem is called The New Breed. Mm. Kim, you have an exquisite sensibility of bringing in the right poetry at the right moment, session after session. So I just wanna thank you and, and acknowledge you uh, in terms of your mastery. Uh, it's so, so wonderful to have a poet laureate of your sublime sensibility. So I just thank you. Who? what a session, everyone. That was uh, Jonathan Porritt one of the great elders and great sages of our time, who's been on the front lines of social activism um, for, well now, four or five decades, and is still living his heart out for the cause of human justice and a positive future. It's an inspiration. And um, I think one of the sources of hope for me 
is people like Jonathan that we just keep on keeping on, man. And the young people, they're rising as they should. Revolution is the purview of the young. Uh, but those of us who are now moving into our elderhood are called onto the front lines as well. You know, we pass the baton, but we don't pass it to give it away. We pass the baton to share the baton. Because under current world circumstances, all of us are called to account. Every choice all of us make counts and helps to shape the future. For those of you who want to carry on the dialogue, uh, uh, Stanley uh, Pokris and others meet every day now uh, in kind of a little after party and after chat uh, group. So uh, that uh, link is in the, uh, in the chat for those of you who want to join. And uh, tomorrow uh, we're going to uh, go uh, with uh, another book that's just been published, Building on Hope and Hell. Uh, by Jonathan, which I hope you all uh, order. Uh, it's a book by Andrew Harvey and Carolyn Baker called Radical Regeneration. The world has moved beyond sustainability, adaptation. The only thing left is to radically regenerate ourselves, our spirituality, our relationship to the earth and the earth itself. So tomorrow, same time, same station, five o'clock p.m. Central European time uh, here on Zoom, uh, we'll be talking with Andrew Harvey and Carolyn Baker on radical regeneration. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant session. Brilliant, brilliant session. Bye for now. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.